on our very first episode of Fun Fundamentals, we dive into creating competitive robots on a budget, including what teams can create that focuses on simplicity and sustainability. We have guests from all around FRC to provide their insight and demonstrate what their teams have done, plus other examples as well. Something for every team to learn. This is Fun Fundamentals. Your destination for first content, updates, and gaming. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First updates now, supported by Stryker Careers. If you are a college student or recent graduate looking for an incredible internship, take a look at Stryker. Stryker provides a housing stipend, great pay, and an opportunity to work with state-of-the-art medical technology equipment. Discover why so many first alumni are coming to Stryker for their internship or career at careers.stryker.com. First updates now, supported by Kettering University. Kettering University hosts three co-op employment fairs each year for incoming and current students. Participating in the co-op employment process at Kettering is a great way to begin turning robotics experience into a professional career to earn money towards graduating debt-free. If you are a senior, it's not too late to apply at kettering.edu slash apply. Welcome to Fun Fundamentals, Fun's newest show where we focus at the and at the skills and hone in on important subjects that every team should know about how you can bring those into the first community and they sh then teams share their ex expertise on how you can make your team better. I'm your host, Sky Leak, with Team 2767 Strike Force, with my co-host today from 3847 Spectrum in Texas and a Woody Flowers Championship recipient, Alan Gregory. Thank you, Sky. Let's also welcome our guest for our topic on robots on a budget. Jack Sprengler is from 1756 Argos in Illinois, whose team won two regionals this year and was a championship division finalist. We also have, we also have Preston Purdue is a mentor and Ben Gates is a student from 3357 Comets out of Michigan, whose team won two districts and were division finalists at the Michigan State Championship. Welcome, everyone. Over the years, there have been many innovations in the FRC space. The rise of districts, the COTS revolution, and formerly two champs, rest in peace. The cost of running a perennial competitive program um, has kind of ebbed and flowed as the years have gone on. Uh, and teams have, have to manage these travel expenses, robot costs, and all the time budgets as mentor and student uh, proportions uh, change throughout the years. There have been many world-class robots designed and fabricated with relatively minimal hours and funds. Part of the great paradigm shift from the dark ages of drill motors has been the introduction of widespread adaptation of the kit of parts chassis. Uh, this offers, of course, a, a baseline and a starting point for teams so they can focus on the other aspects of their machine. Recently, this has come a bit under attack uh, with commercial off-the-shelf swerve. Um, of course, every year has different drive chain needs. Um, and many teams have come to the conclusion that Swerve might be necessary to be competitive. Um, to both teams joining us, Comets and Argos, and to anyone in chat that wants to chime in, is Swerve a sustainable option for teams focused on the time and monetary uh, segment of team management, especially if it isn't guaranteed to be used every single year? Jack? Uh, I, yeah, we're... We're in the tricky situation of we used to be tank drive every single year until the past two years. It kind of seemed that it had to be necessary. Um, for us, it really worked out. Um, we would do a lot of drive practice over the summer where we would have our students drive and we'd have two tank robots and then a swerve robot. And we start off, you have basically like a four corners and uh, each corner would be one, two, three, four. The swerve would start off in the spot, have to get to another corner. And uh, we got to a point that none of the tank robots could ever touch our driver as they went from one corner to the other corner, no matter what. And they started playing prevent defense, blocking zones of they know that they got to go to one of the corners or not and doing a shift team defense. And the swerve still was able to juke a lot of the drivers during their driver training. And that's kind of when we got absolutely sold on swerve that it if it's flat, I, I want swerve. I want a kid out there that can move wherever he can it's 
and the price of it has gotten down in simplicity. And I think we will get to a point in the next two, three years where mechanically it will start to plateau like it did with the, the tank drives. And so the cost of it will start start to go down. Um, but I think you're seeing a massive innovation with Swerve that is just has, has come out. It seems like out of nowhere, but we had two years of we had two years of people just to practice and play with it that really developed. And from the kind of FRC and grace, gracious professionalism standpoint, there's a lot of very common parts out there now that used to be a there used to be a reason not to do Swerve. You couldn't go and get a bunch of you know various. I mean, it was a custom. All, it was always an in-house uh, in-house solution. Um, so now that we're kind of moving into the that space where you can go and ask a team, hey, I need such and such a shaft because something stripped. Um, is that how does that plan for your thought process there? Uh, I, I feel like it's a similar to past years that you uh, you just have an extra swerve module uh, and you just kind of have to build that into your budget and pad pad everywhere else. Uh, plus, plus with swerve, you get simplicity of the robot that you don't you might not need a turret you might not need other other things you needed in the past uh that you can change off in the cost savings and when you start getting to a point of having the similar parts year after year after year i think if you're building a program you can really develop the part basis and just just the intro to it is is the big the big difference uh we're going from mk we have mk3s and i know the mk4s came out and we we're at that uh bit of the jump where they came out and we're, we're now trying to see what makes cost to effective, like what's the most cost effective solution. That's something we're going to be checking out probably over the summer and really debating on where to spend our money, especially now with champs being in Houston. Um, and so I, it's, it's kind of where we're at. It, as long as you're playing the long-term game of a program and running your program, like a franchise, I don't think it'll be a thing or a big issue in the next five, six years. But if you're playing for tomorrow, it can, it can hit your pocket. All right. And that kind of leads us uh, to asking Preston and Ben, um, you guys went a different route than a lot of kind of teams this year on uh, your approach and you still managed to be quite successful. So got a little rebuttal there. Yeah, I'd say, I, I think Swerve as is evidenced by a lot of the Einstein play that we saw Swerve is very much uh, sort of seemed to be very much the meta at the top level of competition this year. Um, we did look at it briefly last off season um, from uh, looking at the market, seeing what's available, but we didn't end up pulling the trigger on it. We elected to continue down the tank drive uh, development. Uh, the keys with that this year were pushing towards rapid maintenance and being able to change things quickly. Um, if you do have issues and compactness, um, there were instances I wish we were swerve, definitely, uh, from a competitive standpoint. Yeah. Um, but we made it work, uh, found the right tread combination finally after lots of tuning on that too. So we liked how the robot performed. Um, but who knows what next year holds uh, from a season perspective and a field perspective. I'm hoping for a not flat field, but we'll see. <laughs> I will say that I don't think Swerve is is needed to win a regional. I don't think Swerve is needed to win a district. I, I'm, I'm just saying when you get to the end, at some of that top level play, when you have really, really hard defense and everybody is out there in playing and everyone won regionals, then that's when I think maybe Swerve might be in your pocket. But for the for most teams, I still don't think it's, uh, it's it's more of take what cost you need, see what's the best for your team. If you're still trying to figure out a lot of like picking up a piece, I think you stick uh, stick with a lot of tank drive for a lot of teams. And I think once you build up your fundamentals, then you take on Swerve. And I think that needs to really be addressed too, that Swerve is not the end all be all for everybody. You got to really hone the fundamentals before you you, you take a lot of. And from a, from a budget standpoint, how was a, a monetary budget? um how was the um kind of the the build up and maintenance um of of swerve and seeing that into the next year 
um because i don't know exactly where you were at uh on the on the team uh ben um but from a student standpoint you know you kind of get thrown into a, a new kind of world all of a sudden um and you weren't on swerve in particular but you said you're focused on mm -hmm. like repairability and such of your um of your mechanisms and stuff like that um is maybe a out of house like more complex uh system uh is that maybe scary from a student perspective or is it just unknown and you just get used to it over time i think one of the biggest things to consider with swerve i think jack brought this up is that when you have like caught swerve like um sds or uh, west coast products or even the fristy swerve um it becomes a lot less square uh, scary for out of house when other teams are all using the same modules right. so Although this year we had like super easy to repair tank drive. I think we even talked about it on our behind the bumpers. We can swap a whole drive wheel right out mm -hmm. and pop a new one in. We had spares. It becomes a lot less scary to kind of venture out into um, much more complex when other teams also have much right. more complex and they have the same parts. It's, you know, pop right back in. Um, so that's a really huge advantage. And I think, I don't know if I'm scared of going um, out of house. I think it's different for us because um, we're kind of, uh, we like to do things in house, so we can do it our style. Uh, but I think it's easier now with God's components. All right. Um, and Alan, do you have any thoughts, especially from being, I mean, Texas swapped over to districts a couple of years ago, <laughs> right before this whole thing got all sorts of crazy. So we, we did. So I, I think the biggest thing is kind of harping on what uh, Jack said earlier is that Swerve doesn't make teams good. And so like we did see Einstein and like a lot of people have harped on that, but very few of those, almost none of those teams were on Einstein just because they were Swerve. Those teams were already, a vi were very good and very competitive and they could build a very competitive tank drive if they wanted to. This game and a lot of the rules and other things lend itself very, very much to Swerve where right. we will see other, a lot of those teams, if, and if we get a different game, we get, like we've already said, non-flat field or just a game where it's more linear or where you may have to not get pushed off your spot as much and you need to just get back to those big high traction, drive trains again we might see that go back that way so teams are making the best strategic decision this year very much happened to be swerve in 20 in 2022 it doesn't mean it'll always be so if whatever you can do to spend your resources wisely to just get better at building frc robots that doesn't need to be swerve gotcha gotcha so before we move on to our next discussion topic let's bring on our producer tyler to talk about our wonderful friends from striker Hey, thanks a lot, Sky. Uh, once again, Striker and Striker Careers, if you're looking for a great place uh, to get your internship, uh, first job out of college, or if you're looking for a seasoned career, Striker is looking for you. And of course, for co-ops and internships, looking for new ones coming in the fall, here's a little bit more about Striker and Striker Careers and the culture that they have over at Striker. I love working for Striker. I'm genuinely excited to come to work every day. The minute you walk through that door, you know you are part of something special. We support each other and look out for each other. I love Stryker because we are like a family. At Stryker, I own my career. There are so many different places Stryker can take me in the next five years. Noi crediamo che quello che facciamo è molto importante. Together, with our customers, we are driven to make healthcare better. Great people with a strong mission and values can accomplish great things together. All right, um, Preston and Ben. So we're going to start talking about the Comets budget um, and deep dive into how you all work. Sounds good. Thanks, Alan. Um, so the the center of our topic really is around not necessarily cost, but the complexity budget that we think can really help mid-level teams, you know, improve uh, and low-level teams even. A lot of the stuff is similar to what you may have seen before from every bot, um, but we think those themes can apply even at high levels too. So that's some of the things we'll go through. So a bit of an introduction. My name's Preston. Um, I've been in FRC for about 12 years now. Oh gosh, that's pretty long. Um, <laughs> for my day job, I'm I work at a company called JR Automation, and I integrate industrial robots into big factories. Ben, you want to introduce? Yep. Uh, what's up? I'm Ben Gates. I am next year's season's uh, student captain, as, also, as well as CAD captain. I have experience in building fabrication on the team, and I will be going into my sixth year in first as a student. All right. Now, a quick overview of what we're going to talk about. 
first, we're going to kind of uh, iterate on how we approach a season, specifically this past season. Then we're going to move into themes and simplicity, and then finish with upgrade path. And that's kind of a what, why, and how. Now we're going to start with how we approach a season. So we're going to kind of start with the uh, three golden rules of your first few days. So this is kind of days one through three, uh, mostly kickoff. Most importantly, think in concepts and actions, um, robot actions, not mechanisms. So instead of saying, you know, I want a, um, a turreted shooter, you can say, you know, robot should land 20 cargo on a match. Also, never hold yourself to one idea because then you're restricting your open mindedness and also ability to think outside of the box. Also, importantly, strategy always dictates design. So you set those goals previously, always fall back on them and think about how do you achieve those goals. Also, always divide into needs, wants, and wishes. So this is kind of your what we can do, what's kind of feasible, and then your stretch goals. And whenever you're brainstorming these needs, wants, and wishes, always remember that only your needs in theory are guaranteed. So never try and cram anything in there that you really can't achieve in three or four weeks. Kudos to Karthik. These are some of his golden rules, as some people might recognize. <laughs> so for simplicity, when we're moving from the season goals into our design phase, what we try to minimize our our degrees of freedom so dofs we think that fewer complexities about the robot you know can be enabled through fewer degrees of freedom so if there's any way you can uh, combine degrees of freedom to do multiple actions that's always an advantage um, simple designs can be can be difficult from a conceptualization standpoint compared to complex things uh, but keeping things simple early is really critical. Um, looking at needs from brainstorming is also, you need to keep those in the front of your minds. Um, and then inspiration from around the community. There's lots of simple mechanisms that are out there that you can, that you can copy and, and take inspiration from. Scheduling is something, uh, a different topic, uh, and being simple helps you go faster in general. Um, there's some cases where that's not true, but we find that if we can finish the comp competition robot in four weeks, that is the goal. So there's plenty of time for practice. And then you can start moving into working through upgrade paths uh, with you know, being intentional about that. Yeah. And a big theme of keeping simple is that generally it's kind of a human tendency to overcomplicate things. It can be easier to overcomplicate than actually keep things simple. So it kind of takes maturity and experience to step back and say, OK, what do I need? Um, how can I cut something down to reduce degrees of freedom, um, reduce motor count, et cetera? So moving on to the next topic, themes and simplicity. Um, we're going to go over some of the different sub-assemblies of the robot this past year and talk through a bit why we did things. So everything you see highlighted in orange is an iteration basically from a year prior. So drivetrain is an iteration. Our indexer and shooter were from two, 2020, 2021. Um, the hood was done in an off-season build for uh, infinite recharge. And the climb elevator is an improvement from even earlier than that. So taking recent mechanisms and revising them up, making them more serviceable, uh, and really rethinking through how can we make this as simple as possible. Um, was was very nice this year from a design standpoint. Yeah, and especially most teams will talk about taking from inspiration from other teams. But when you really focus on your own uh, past mechanisms, your history as a team, really that's not only getting you the benefit of kind of having the mechanism already designed, but if it's something that you've done before, you're super knowledgeable in kind of the quirks of that mechanism. So it really cuts down the time to iron out uh, any you know problems that you might have. Uh, and here's just a quick example of that hood. So on the left, we have our hood from last year and in infinite recharge. And on the right, we have our hood from this year. So we'll just do an explode view here. Let's skip ahead. So you can see that um, although we may have a little, a few changes based on packaging. So we had a larger diameter ball. So we have to kind of scale up that diameter. But other than that, uh, these two mechanisms are super, super similar. And because we already knew how to design this mechanism, it only took us like a day or two. Um, and it was super reliable. So it's really that benefit of almost kind of stealing from yourself. Oops, sorry. Come on. And then here's another really great example of uh, from another team. Uh, this is Spartan Robotics. Oops, sorry about that. Um, 
And on the left, you see their robot from 2016. And that game was Stronghold. It was really similar to this year. They had like big uh, crystal balls, foam balls that are about the same diameter as this year, as the car going this year. So what they did, if you look on the left, they just kind of plucked their intake essentially off and put it on their 2020 robot times two, uh, and it was super effective. So one thing that we try to focus on is, you know, if you can keep things as simple as possible, it becomes easier to integrate them together. And integration can be one of the harder challenges with FRC, making mechanisms move either around each other or sometimes through things, as you saw with Spartan. Um, that can get really complicated really quickly. So keeping things simple will help with easier integration. This is an example that you see on screen of a quick and dirty prototype bolted, riveted together um, in an hour, and then going into CAD, making sure the packaging fits, and then assembling it onto our practice robot. Um, it's got a single degree of freedom. It was a prototype built in a night and then was on the bot two days later. Yeah. I got a oh, sorry. quick question. If you got any, uh, I know you're talking about and showing a lot of them. Uh, what was maybe some of the biggest takeaways? I guess you showed your shooter. But uh, from last year to this year, with the game being so similar, that was able for you guys to really look back at. Was it the shooter? Uh, any other key takeaways or? Yeah, from a shooting. Still... Yeah, for a shooting game, um, it, it feels like this has been a game after game after game. It's been so many, uh, so many shooting games, not in a row, but in recent history that we could pull from, um, going back to 2017, 2016, even right. Um, I felt that way with elevator games for a while there too. It did, yeah. yeah. And why not use an elevator for climb, right? <laughs> but uh, the, for the shooting, right? That was it's a newer game piece, right? We were very concerned early on that we would have the same kind of um, tacky game piece feel, even though this is a tennis ball. We weren't sure how the game pieces were going to interact, so we were a little concerned that starting index or prototyping it was going to be more of a challenge. But as many teams found out, it's it's not the hardest to index things through as long as you maintain constant contact. Um, so that was a relief, I suppose, and let us kind of jump towards refining the hood, uh, making it more serviceable, more reliable, more robust um, Okay. for improvements on that. So that's where so we So other than that, you just mostly made the same, a similar, similar shooter. Yep, pretty much. Just more robust and okay, mm -hmm. sweet. Yep, kind of honing in. Absolutely. And I can speak to that too with Strike Force last year. We just kind of picked and placed a large portion mm -hmm. of our shooter stuff. Like it's Yeah. Pretty uh, much. I don't think we were the only ones either. Mm -hmm. I think that was rampant across FRC. Absolutely. Now, simplicity is helpful, but it's not, you know, the end all be all. Not all complexity is bad. Ben. Um, yeah. So we've talked about like, you know, why simplicity is so awesome. Uh, but occasionally you kind of need uh, a little bit of complexity. And our big kind of showpiece mechanism this year for our robot, for Atlas, was our intake. And our intake is a four-bar linkage. It's not necessarily mechanically complex, but the reason it was a, a bigger mechanism for us is because we've never done a mechanism identical to this or very similar. Although we've had similar designs, um, nothing like this has come up before. So there are really two ways we accomplished and were successful with intake, uh, and those are priorities and optimization. So when you have a bunch of mechanisms that you're kind of um, basing off previous years, you can get those done quickly and not worry about them as much. And then you can focus on something that has more um, weight to it, like our intake. And then of course, also optimizing. That's all about just prototype, test, et cetera. And that cycle continues. I think our um, by Kelvin, our first comp, we had I think six or seven revisions on our intake. And even throughout the season, we were iterating before states and worlds. Um, and even like a couple of days ago, we added a revision onto our intake. So it's constant revision. And it's always also knowing your priorities. Mm -hmm. Did the rule change with fouls really develop with your intake too? I guess with everyone having the. So a lot of the, I don't think we really, so we, we I mean, we foresaw the fouls being a big problem. Um, and that's why we, we always uh, were adamant on having a really quick intake, especially. Uh, we had no mm -hmm. pneumatics in our intake. Actually, it was a uh, motor driven. So we had that gearing quick. Most of the consideration for the four bar was damage because we knew we were going to be slamming around that field fast, uh, fast, light swerve drive or not swerve drive, sorry, tank drive. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it's kind of ironic. Uh, we wanted to make sure that thing, when we hit a wall hard, it would just come right in. So we even did what's called like the grasshopper test where you just essentially full speed it into a wall. 
Um, I think we actually broke the wall and the intake was pretty much uh, left without a scratch. So that was really a, a main key component for so that. That brings us actually to an important little point on budgeting is spares. Yes. Um, as far as points of failure, if it's just a little piece of polycarb, that's not a, a crazy expensive thing. If you're bending shafts left and right, so where'd you guys fall on that for designing for um, designing for breakage? You know. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so you, we're not quite at the point, I don't think, and maybe some FRC teams are at the elite level, but I don't think our team is necessarily at the point where we can design in breakpoints. We can make a guess about where we think things will break, um, but it's not like we've done the simulations that some teams have um, to actually identify that or add in purposeful stress risers, yeah. et cetera. Maybe that's something we'll explore in future years from a polycarb standpoint, since it's easy to add stress risers to that if you're, if you're, uh, if you're uh, conscious about it. Um, but polycarb is very cheap, as you mentioned, Sky. So it's it's nice. You can batch make it uh, very quickly with our router and bring lots of spares. Absolutely. Yeah. Or even just really make a master masterpiece and drill a bunch of little strips. Yeah. If you're not you, in the in the router game, you don't need a router. Uh, you can absolutely make paper templates, and lots of teams have been successful with that. Yeah. All right, moving on, we're going to talk a little bit about upgrade path um, now, and specifically how to kind of pertain to us. So actually, and there's our shooter from this year uh, with the turret and puddle upgrade path in the background. Okay, so we're going to try and explain this as best as we can. But on the top graph there in the middle, you can kind of see uh, an arbitrary estimate of uh, comp season difficulty over time. So in week one, you're kind of like at the level three, pretty low. And then by worlds, you're at a nine or 10. And those are just arbitrary values, but it's a self-relative scale. So what happens is teams will try, especially in the first few years, they'll try and make a robot that's more like um, on the left, on the bottom left. That's just kind of like a really solid eight out of the gate. And it kind of stays that way. Uh, the problem is, is that's really hard. And also it's... Um, less feasible. So instead of doing that, you can do something more like on the right of the graph on the right, where you start it with a more um, simple seven, and then kind of in the middle of the season have a big planned mechanical upgrade to jump up to that nine. So you're always staying above the competition. Um, and importantly, both of these methods use the same amount of resource points, which is just kind of an arbitrary number that determines um, how successful your team is. So a team like 254 may have like 95 resource points, arbitrary resource points, we may have closer to 75 or 80. Um, and this kind of graph with the two overlay values shows that. So if you have the competition at the bottom in black, you're always staying above that level when you have an upgraded robot. Cool. So we've talked about why you should upgrade. And now we're going to talk about, you know, how do you pull off an upgrade? So, and there were main kind of three main takeaways for us this year. First of all, always start really early. Uh, main CAD, at least for us, finishes around kind of like mid build season. So week two or three, you should always start upgrades either as part of that main CAD or immediately after. Also, always make sure you delegate resources. So if you have a CAD team of like three or four kids, make sure someone's working on upgrades and someone is still working on revisions to past mechanisms. Um, that way you're always staying on top of things. Also, always keep your upgrade ideas in mind when designing. Really, you don't want to be kind of screwing yourself later. You want to make your life in comp season as easy as possible. So you should just kind of be slotting in parts. So only changing a few things. Also, never change anything major, because if you do, like if you go from tank to swerve, that's a huge change. But if you're just like adding a control panel mechanism on, that's not that big of a deal. And then as well, we have a little animation to show off how we did our turret this year. So if you look here on kind of the bottom, um, this is just our normal shooter. So weeks uh, one through three with Calvin and Muskegon, we just had this shooter. And basically to make our lives as easy as possible for upgrade package, we just kind of fattened up the hood, slotted in that hood roller, which is popped in there, which is like a standalone mechanism. And then literally brought up the plate for a shooter and slot it in the turret right there. It's just a little pancake that slots right in. So we're not redesigning the indexer. We're not changing the main geometry on the shooter. We're just kind of essentially lifting it up, giving it a facelift um, and shoving that turret in. So we're just adding things on. Yeah, and the critical thing with upgrades is you need to make sure that there's enough time to debug. Um, upgrades can completely change the character operating, uh, operating window of your robot is the best way to say it and plan time to tune and make sure you can fully understand your new newer updated creation yeah 
because upgrades don't just change mechanically. It's also programming and wiring. All yeah. that changes at the same time. One thing that we noticed was, uh, and you might have noticed through watching matches, sometimes we weren't as consistent after the upgrade. So we noticed there were a couple improvement points uh, personally as a team we could make. And some of those were identified as the initial hesitation on the transition from non-turreted to turret. Um, it's a big leap from a capability standpoint to add that in. And we definitely overcomplicated wire management. Um, there were lots of teams that had turrets and never went down. We had a couple of little instances early on that, that made things interesting from a wire management standpoint, but uh, that reliability really was key. And we found- Wire that management is really, really uh, not thought of as much as it really needs to be thought of at first. And I think it's an afterthought that a lot of people, we, we struggled the past three years of figuring out wire management. So we're hundred percent with you, man, where it's, that is yeah. the, one of the hardest aspects of the turret that I think is just not thought about. Yeah. And finding a nice place to integrate it is just, it's a nightmare. <laughs> so we could have helped ourselves with that maybe with a bit more foresight, but, um, lessons learned, right? So lessons learned. And finally, we're going to wrap up with uh, just a little into synopsis of what we talked about. So first remember simplicity. Uh, is about few degrees of freedom. So a degree of freedom, let's say you have a shooter with a wheel that spins, that's one degree of freedom. If you have a turreted shooter, that's two degrees of freedom. Also remember that simple isn't always easy, but simple is almost always the best, and that's Occam's razor. Also make sure you have open-mindedness, don't stick yourself to one idea, that's a bad idea. Um, always iterate on past designs. This is something, this is something huge with first, um, it's all about patterns. So you're always gonna have your shooting games, your placement games, like we talked about, sometimes it's stagnant for a few years. So you can look on past years and say, hey, we had a shooter last year, why not use it again? Also, always optimize the resources. Sometimes you need complexity. So that's kind of like shifting your weight towards a harder mechanism that you know is going to be hard. For us, that was the intake. Um, also, improvise, adapt, overcome. It's about upgrades. You know, competitions change. They get harder. You know, why shouldn't your robot be more competitive later on? Don't just stay stagnant. Also, always make sure you accommodate, accommodate your design for upgrades and learn our lesson in reliability. Thank you, guys. Any questions? Well, I was just really impressed how you just kind of knew that you could chop it off at the shoulders and slip a turret in, a turret ring in, um, and just knowing that upgrade path exists. And that even is like upgrade path for, it doesn't need to be like necessarily like adding a whole other mechanism. It can be adding more liability with your upgrade path. And maybe that upgrade path is like, we know we're up against the wall with time to get this robot done. Maybe the wiring's a little messy but we're going to spend, you know, 10 hours at some point getting this thing absolutely clean as can be, right? Just to save yourself time at the comp later, you know, uh, a second or something like that. Absolutely. Like, yeah. To upgrade mid-year to a turret is also, <laughs> I'll say as a non-Michigan team, pretty ridiculous, but yeah. I feel like there's a way different uh, feeling or mantra from everyone not being coming from a district's from the districts, especially with the, even the open bag, we still run is not open bag. We we, we, we we do it as a traditional year and we we utilize the open bag, but look, yeah, I, I still feel like there's way bigger jumps still made from the district teams than there were made from the others. Yeah, and as Tyler's showing now, the, the old hood, it was literally just unbolt it, raise it up and insert the new mechanism. So it was kind of a happy coincidence there. Um, we did foresee that having a turret early season would be very helpful. So we did kind of remind ourselves, hey, keep in mind, you may need to add this later since mm -hmm. no swerve, no turret would be very, very difficult to play at the highest levels. Um, so Alan, did you have oh, any yeah, thoughts? I, on that? I have one more question for you all. I was looking through your robot and CAD and everything. Can you guys talk about how you standardize on materials and parts and things to help mm -hmm. you it down? It looks like you're using a lot of the same things over and over throughout the robot. Yeah. Absolutely. Great question, Alan. So we try to maintain the extrusion, uh, the VersaTube, right, wherever we can. VersaTube and Polycarb. Um, that is how we tried to build a robot this year. And it was it was so nice to standardize on that. I mentioned we have our access to a router, thankfully, but 
and like we mentioned earlier as well, you don't necessarily need that to, to do good, solid polycarb designs. Um, one other thing I'll mention uh, from a construction standpoint, a lot of the a lot of the drive tube design was done off season, just like kind of how you would develop a sort of module that swappable drive tube didn't really exist uh, before 2021. So adding that capability in and, and really prioritizing serviceability was a step forward we made this year and not necessarily materials related question, but from a robot construction standpoint. Yep, makes a lot of sense. Before we get into our next topic, let's bring Tyler back on to talk about Fund's continued sponsor, Ketting, Kettering University. Hey, thanks, Scott. Yeah, I'm at Kettering University. Hey, if you're looking for a fantastic school to go to, especially coming up in uh, fall here, we're going to have, of course, uh, uh, new enrollments starting as well, too. Check out Kettering University. Of course, they have their fantastic robotics lab. Kettering kickoff coming up as well, too, in September. So if you're looking at getting more about Kettering University, you can do that. Head over to Kettering.edu, and here's a little bit more about Kettering and financial aid. When I was considering where to go to college, one of the biggest things for me was figuring out how I was going to be able to pay for college. And it wasn't really until I came to Kettering to one of the dog days of summer events that I figured out how I was gonna be able to do that. And it was actually because of the senior chemical engineering student. She was getting ready to graduate and she had told me about all of her phenomenal experiences, both on co-op and here on campus. But more importantly, she told me that she was gonna graduate debt free. And that was an eye-opener for me. That was the first time I'd ever heard that from a college student. And so that's when I knew that I was sold. So really from there, as soon as I came to Kettering, I knew that that was going to be my goal. I wanted to graduate debt-free. And I did that through a variety of ways. First, of course, the co-op experience was a tremendous help. But I even looked at uh, ways to work here on campus. So I was a federal work-study student. I worked in a variety of organizations. And that not only gave me the extra funds, but also different opportunities to meet people and understand our resources here at Kettering. Also looking at scholarships, not only here at Kettering University, but even from my hometown and other sources, all of this cumulatively helped me to graduate debt free. Thank you, Kettering University. Now, a prominent team in Illinois is 1756 Argos. And for years, they've been doing a bit at Central uh, Illinois Regional. Uh, and this kind of brings us into uh, Jack's little presentation here. Um, I've heard in the past you've done a little bit with careful control of COTS uh, components throughout the years to keep costs down. Yeah, we're pretty cheap. So <laughs> we'll kind of we'll kind of go through it. You'll see how dirty we are too. And so showing everything. Uh, I made this presentation actually a couple of years ago, uh, right after COVID, right before COVID was starting, or right when it was hitting. Uh, and so it's so a lot, a little bit updated, outdated with Swerve and everything, but it's still a lot of it goes through and what we like to use. Uh, a little bit about myself is I've been around forever. I've been around since. Uh, 2008, uh, I was in seventh grade and asking to be on it. Uh, and just showing right here of we've we've been around the block. We've played worlds. Uh, we we've, uh, we've won five division finalists. We haven't pushed through to Einstein, but we've been real close. I guess the last five of the last six championships we've been at finalists, even with Sky and a couple others. Uh, and then I work at a precision machine shop at JH Benedict's and I do FANUC robot automation also there. Um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, one thing that we like to look at is we, we use first as a franchise. Uh, so all your purchases don't have to be in one year. You don't have to make, you don't have to be a world championship your first year. You build your program like you build any other program, like any high school team. Um, and we started off really not doing too hot and took a lot of years that uh, we were lucky to be selected and happy to be selected to trying to win a regional to, well, we just want to do a, well at Worlds. Um, so we like to use a lot of recycling your robots, build similar, and then pick your battles with time and money. Money is time and time is money, and that needs to be thought of too. Uh, one thing is we we have a lot of capabilities in 1756, but I think at the same time we, we have to make – make gains from where we don't, we don't have a lot of space. We have a very, uh, I guess, STEM oriented uh, program, but at the end of the day, uh, 
we, we have a weld shop, we got a wood shop, we got engineering, so we got automotive, but we don't have any place to put our robot. So we pretty much build out of an eight by eight closet that we got to put a robot in all our COTS parts at the end of the night. We have a CNC router, they have a plasma cutter that we're allowed to use, but you still got to pick your robot. So we, we have to max out our organization and uh, by, by, you can see right here in the, uh, in the picture that we have the gears, we have the wheels, and we utilize those every single year. Um, so one thing I like to show is we, we like to recycle a lot of it. So the wheels, year to year to year, are, are pretty similar. They don't wear out too much on game pieces. And just to show, you got to pick where you want to take your battles. Like drive motors, this was way easier decision before Swerve and before all the brushless motors with now integration came in where everyone used to have sim motors where we'd always make sure we had a new drive motor because if you don't drive, you can't play. We'll see how it's going. We're going to do, we're doing a little bit of testing with Falcons because that's what we ran and seeing how we can use those in the future. But also it kind of breaks down the price right here of all your compressors, your pneumatic modules, everything that every single year you do not have to rebuy in our situation. We've, we've been using them for multiple years. Um, in the past, I will say if you're on a budget, I would definitely run with tank and I would go with it and it's every single year they're a winner until you get to this year but <laughs> but this year's way different and we like to stay off when we did tank even if we don't do tank we like to do that we like to stay at least one of our dimensions under 28 inches and we have to do that because we have to fit through a door every single day and that's what the standard door size is so when the game starts we already know what size we're going to be and with swerve it makes it a little bit easier in the past, we used Venoms when they came out. They were just, they were the cheapest motor at the time. And we actually had a mentor who developed a lot of them. He came out with them. And then right as they came out with brushless motors, they were no longer a thing. So they're too heavy now. Um, kind of just going over motor selection. You can see the price breakdown of what the motor selection is, where you can really bring them out. And I'll post this presentation later on so people can go through it along with all our CAD and other parts. I just want to get to more of the stuff that's more to this year than in the past years. Um, I think one of the biggest things you need to do is you need to develop a build style and use, this, use the same build style year after year after year. We developed the year rivet style in 2014, and that's when we started doing well. Uh, we ended up ranking first in our division at Worlds, uh, which we were a fish out of water, not really knowing what's going on. First year's lucky to make it to Worlds, then finally uh, becoming better and better year after year. But uh, what we what we do typically is uh, we haven't bought aluminum the past four years. Like I said, we run it as a franchise. You buy it as a, we bought it as a bulk when the prices were down, and we wait till the prices are down to rebuy again. Um, and then we just use the same whole pattern where we use the rib nut style. Uh, we use a Versa similar, but we we have everything where you can put a rib nut wherever you want in a one inch pattern. Um, very similar to now what the uh, the Rev uh, Rev Ion is now coming into. Uh, and that's, I'm really interested in that and looking into that too, uh, where rib nuts, and you can see this, this is not a cheap style. Having a steel rib nut is, is actually expensive if you can go, but, uh, we end up buying like 10,000 at a time from China and then we just keep <laughs> using them. Um, another thing that we have came up with that was really, really good for us is in the past years, we've been using Delrin as a slider. Uh, and it seemed like we had an unlimited supply because at work we had a bunch of like two inch circle drops that we're not going to use anything for uh, that. We just gave the robotics and we just chop it up and then reuse it. Uh, and it's been refined over year after year uh, from 2008 all the way to uh, to to now. We've we've probably used a Delrin slider uh, or a lot of the similar situations. I've even came out with like a standardization where I've I've messed around and you can see in the bottom right uh, where I was looking to see if I can make it a cheaper water jet. Uh, version that could be used as like kind of a COTS parts. I kind of stepped away. I'm not truly sure on the direction I want to go with it. There's there's a couple designs I have that I might be looking forward in the future to help with others to make it so it's it's way uh, easier and more common. And uh, this was interesting. In 2019, we actually picked a horrible design of a robot uh, where we had way too many degrees of freedom and wire management was absolutely horrible. Uh, to deal with. We, we were able to figure it out and get to work with it. 
Uh, but we were, we, it was before limelight came out and we thought lining up was going to be huge. So we tried to make it so we could just drive forward and back and just have this constant path. And then the limelight just proved that we were not mechanically, it's not mechanically, it was a software issue that we had to really come up with. Um, um, one thing that we like to do is the ArgoBot challenge. This is just a little bit about our team. We prototype. This is how we get our kids into it. We build a little robot and have them do a challenge at the beginning of the year. This year, they had to pretty much just have a wall. Uh, you get one point if you shoot it under, three points if you shot it over. Um, and it, it, it's really good for us developmental, especially for this year. It was really tough to get our kids up to speed. Um, uh, and that goes along with our prototyping. I think right now what we're really looking into is going 80-20 and using 80-20 to pick up our dimensions. And then from our dimensions, our kids usually hand sketch everything. Uh, and then especially now, well, we had almost all freshmen software, like over sophomores, like almost most majority of our team was all first year this year that we didn't really prevalent CAD. We uh, more pushed of teaching design, teaching dimensions, teaching what was an effective, and then pushing manufacturing. We like to lead with the CAM before we even go with CAD and then go back to CAD because we think you need to be able to manufacture before you can design to know where tolerances are needed and, and retrospect from there. Uh, a build schedule. This has not changed now that it's open bag. We like to get from day one, know what our drivetrain is going to be. We like to know if we have to do swerve, we got to do tank. And if so, we know we're 28 by 31 or 30 dimensions and going on from there. And then we like to have the final robot pretty much set up by week four and start building our, our robots week five. Um, and I'm more just going through some of these. These are just past years and past videos of different situations that have worked um, and different implements over the year. And we, we we like to steal from year after year after year. And we are very similar to the comments of where we like to take uh, what's worked in the past and the ideas of what's worked in the past and improve on a lot of it. And then I will go from here and I will show you pretty much the biggest increase we had from last year was figuring out turret wire management. Um, you could kind of see from this picture uh, that we just kind of had a hanging wire last year, which was not too big an issue. Uh, but this year, uh, we, we, we came out with like coming, uh, we, we came out with like a, a forced tensioner, uh, trying to have complete tension on it at every single situation. Uh, I know high tide, I know Mad Town and a lot of others had very similar situations where they had a forced tension sprain, almost guiding the wire track to hold it back. And this took us a while. We didn't come up with this until like week four, week five. And it was it was a year and a half that this was burning into us. Um, another, I'll pull up my CAD from these years. And uh, another thing I really like to show that that I like more, the most thing about, the best thing about a robot in the past couple of years has been uh, our sprocket rack and pinion setup. As you can see, uh, we've we, we used to climb in uh, 2020. We used a rack and pinion climb uh, where we would just use the sprocket hole pattern, and we would just punch those into the hood, and we'd punch those into the uh, aluminum extrusion, where uh, you could just give it the same pattern. And uh, it was really dirty, but at the same time, it was very cheap. Uh, and I can, I'll publish the CAD out here. Uh, as you can see, it's just an uh, eighth inch diameter hole with, a, I think it's a tw the 25, uh, yeah, 20, uh, 0.25 hole pattern. And it's just like chain. It's just like anything else. We started off in 2017 uh, using this where we just... Uh, used it as just what we called the selfie stick uh, because we struggled with uh, in 20, uh, 20, sorry, 2018 when we had cube year and the scale year of when the stacks were getting really high, we couldn't see. So we came out with just this little extender where it didn't weigh anything. And then the next year they're like, oh, how are we going to climb? And the kids are like, oh, let's use the selfie stick to climb. <laughs> and all the mentors are like, that's not going to hold up. <laughs> and here you are. <laughs> And then, yeah, every single year after that, we're like, this is this is just silly. 
not to use it because it's so cheap. It's so dirty. And uh, you can see over here, we were just climbing on the scale and we built that in a day. And it's just extremely easy to implement that I'm trying to figure out if there's a COTS way to improve it in the future. Well, I mean, that's just so simple that a, a jig and careful measurement and you can go through with a, a drill press. It'll take a little bit of time, but yeah, careful measurement and a jig and you can do that. It, two years ago, we didn't even start using the CNC mill about 20, uh, 2019. So like uh, before that, we would use this hole pattern. The kid was just on a bridge port putting the same hole pattern yep. in every single night. And then... Then we got a CNC and we would do all the tube extrusion the very first day. And the kids are like, well, what do we do? I'm like, we'll count the holes, we cut it to length and bolt it together. <laughs> did, did this climb have any failures? Was it able, were you ever breaking rocket teeth or anything? We actually have not. I, I know uh, we, we buy, we bought our aluminum and it wasn't the Vex Pro. Uh, I, we know other teams that, uh, use the, uh, I believe the Vex Pro's uh, uh, aluminum extrusion and then use the bracket to make the whole pattern. They were successful and they, I don't think they have too many issues. Like I said, I'm not on their team. I don't know how they built it. I don't know what they went about, but it was one of the, they had a lot of success with it too, but it seemed like it was punching a different um, hole pattern into theirs. And another thing is uh, we did mess around a little bit with what is the correct diameter pitch to go into the extrusion and also to do and go into the shooter. Cause as you can see here, we used, we used the very similar uh, build style uh, for a shooter. From the comments perspective, are there any like real kind of cheap and dirty tricks you guys have going on for, even if it's not necessarily robot stuff, but maybe for prototyping um, for just kind of like get basic functionality real quick. Yeah, getting basic functionality real quick. Um, that's we we like plywood most of the time, plywood and then measure dimensions. Um, we've tried before, and I actually have seen this quite quite a few times on Spectrum's uh, on Spectrum's blogs with drill a bunch of holes in a pattern, and then it gives you a very quick and easy way to test. Yeah, um, plywood just with, with you know, in plywood is so inexpensive, right? Too so. I always encourage that. Sometimes we'll even go to cardboard. Um, I love cardboard. Cardboard's my starting point. Before <laughs> cardboard pad cardboard. is great. Yeah. Um, so. That's great just for getting the scale and sense of things, how they how they interact um, on, on robot. Yeah, the other ones that we use quite a bit are the different types of clamping 3D printed blocks. So um, right. height blocks, the ones that Ryan Doigno has put out. Um, we have Spectrum's released a couple different versions. Those types of things have helped us a lot in being able to build adjustable prototypes and things we can test with um, that don't cost very much. We can get we print it all out of really cheap PLA, so it ends up being you know dozens and dozens of those things for right. ten dollars for a kilogram of PLA or something like that. Yep. And I had another note on the sliders. Um, I love the Delrin sliders uh, that Argos mentioned. Um, we actually do a similar thing with our uh, with our tube elevators, where we've got a slider running on the inside uh, of a two by one, and you cut a slot in the two by one, and then it's a UHMW piece that we just mill down until it's the right tolerance and the right fit. So, kind of similar to how some of the eighty twenty um, linear extension products yeah. work. Um, uh and yeah, and so I, I, I have a better picture of pretty much what our shooter was. We have developmental from the first year, which was not that great, all the way to the second year. And sorry, my pictures got messed up and started pulling all over and making me sign in. Um, but mm -hmm. we had a, you could have right here where we had a rack and pinion, where we used polycarbonate, where we used the same hole pattern for a yep. shooter. And in 2020 with the very lightweight ball, it, used, it went very well. Uh, and then we used it again this year uh with the iteration being that we wanted to be able to shoot from zero degrees all the way to like i believe it was 35 around um and you can see we use the same exact slider situation where you had the diametral diametral pitch or your pitch diameter where you would hit into the same hole pattern into the polycarbonate and that would push up and push everything else up where we hit came up with just a bracket where we had the double wheel shooter which 
after some early testing found out that it 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 was allowing us to shoot about 30 percent more with only 80 percent of the the shot we were able right. to shoot tremendously further with just the top whirlers and it got rid of the backspin was able to control it um and then also with the polycarbonate uh we we made a couple different hoods where that is just a cheap polycarbonate where you poked it in and then if it didn't like it you can pull it off but we could also put multiple racks so if we are in competition where if we did strip out a hole we could just move them in to the inner set of right holes. build build and your so, redundancy right in yep so all mm-hmm. right that was, well, that was probably the best Yeah, so we do have a question from Chad as well. So are both of your teams building practice bots now that we have um, the open bag, or are you able to just build one robot to save on costs? Thomas, you want to take that first? Yeah, we can take that first. Uh, And the answer is yes, we still do have a practice bot. But it has definitely shifted roles from when the bag rules were in place. We used to try to keep the practice robot and the comp robot as close as possible. Um, in terms of bring practice robot up to comp spec, then bring comp up and match them. Now it's more of practice goes ahead and just kind of lives on its own. Um, and it's different in a lot of ways. Oftentimes mechanisms are way heavier or, you know, are using different motors or actuators even sometimes, um, because it doesn't matter as much where you can work on comp anytime. So, but we're still building too. It's really nice from a development perspective because turret went on to that, I think week five into the competition, week five into build season. Yeah, we had um, turret on um, before end of build season, then we had it on ready for Countwood um, by week five. So yeah, by week five for competition, competition season. season, yeah. But quick and dirty and like things like plywood or polycarb with extra holes in it will still, still exist on it. Yeah. Polycarb with extra holes and you know heavy full quarter inch plate right. when we don't want to try to be yeah. finicky with things, right? right? Yeah. Experimental. Yeah. Experimental. Mm-hmm. All right. What about you, Jack? Uh, yeah, we've been building the second robot since about 20, uh, 20, 2016. We tried to build the second robot. It was it was a big, big task the first year. But after 2015, uh, we did really well. And we lost to the Robonauts and the Citrus Circuits. And they're like, you guys only build our robot? We're like, you guys don't? <laughs> <laughs> Back then when it wasn't as transparent. Uh, yeah. And yeah. But so we, we do now, it's one of your built-in costs that you buy the products. You can reuse a lot of the electronics and the cost of material of the aluminum and the polycarbonate is probably the cheapest thing. Like what's, uh, it's like probably an extra $500 when you, when really the cost of going to Worlds is like 20 grand for teams and traveling and everything that yeah. an extra, an extra two, three grand is not, not, not going to break the bank compared to be careful. So yeah. Well, uh, thank everybody for tuning into our first episode of Fun Fundamentals. If you have topics that you think we should be approaching, reach out on Fun's Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. Don't forget to make sure that you are following us on our Twitch channel and subscribe to our YouTube channel under first updates now. Now, to stay up to date on all of first content, a special thank you to all of those individuals um, and those that are financially supporting the stream. Twitch bits or subscription by clicking on youtube.join. Your support really helps us to continue to make great content. Thank you, of course, to our uh, guests, Jack, Preston, and Ben for coming onto our show. And on behalf of our producer, Tyler Olds, my co-host, Alan, I'm Sky Leak. Thank you for watching Fun Fundamentals. We will be a monthly show, so check in on the Fun Discord for scheduling. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to Kettering University for their support of this video. Kettering University hosts three co-op employment fairs each year for incoming and current students. Participating in the co-op employment process at Kettering is a great way to begin turning robotics experience into a professional career to earn money towards graduating debt-free. If you are a senior, it is not too late to apply at kettering.edu slash apply. Thanks to Stryker Careers for their support in this video. First alumni and mentors are making Stryker a top priority for their internships and careers. That's because Stryker knows that those in first are the leaders and innovators of tomorrow. If you want to help make the world a better place by creating life-saving medical devices and technology, get started at careers.stryker.com. Thanks for watching. If you want to join us for future fun streams, be sure to click the follow button and turn on the notification bell to know when we're live. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. 
view archives, and unique content at youtube.com forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now and check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.